We finally made it to the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. Woohoo, next round's on me. Fun time. No, all right. This is the, uh, the giant bronze Albertosaurus sculpture uh, made by David Thomas back in the 80s. Uh, because you see, that's how I primarily knew this museum was on those old uh, Midwich dinosaur tapes with uh, Gary Owens and Eric Boardman. And because you see in uh, Son of Dinosaurs, then veiled the sculpture and interviewed the artist. So I mean, I, I just grew up watching that over and over. It's almost, it's almost kind of like meeting your hero, you know? Seeing these dinosaurs here. Uh, you know, the sign says, teeth of Albertosaurus have been found in New Mexico. That's of course per predicated on the faulty assumption that dinosaur teeth are diagnostic. They are not. Um, you can only get it down to like the family. Um, but yeah, it's still pretty cool though. And there's the sun kind of washing it out. Incredible. And then over here, this was unveiled in the, the previous tape. Uh, dinosaurs, dinosaurs, dinosaurs. This is Pentaceratops, meaning five horned face because originally they thought they kind of this was a horn. I think it's. I think it's just the uh, extension of the cheekbone there. I do. But indeed. Yeah. I remember when they unveiled this. He got his own little parade. <laughs> Panaceratops is in fact known from New Mexico. In fact, it's known only from New Mexico. It's actually kind of some, well, I guess when they uh, decided state fossils, they hadn't found this yet. So I imagine they would have made this their state fossil instead of Coelophysis. All right, here we are on our way to time tracks. I kind of skipped ahead to the, I got a message there probably from Andy, but I kind of skipped ahead a bit because, you know, they do have some nice Paleozoic specimens, but we're here to see New Mexico, and this is kind of the first one uh, uh, from the Permian period, about 280 million years ago. We see maybe it looks like a conifer, fern, um, and then over here we have their other bit of Permian, which are these uh, footprints which they think may or may not have been made by Demetrodon. You know, the big sailback guy. Oh, damn glare. And, um, the, you know, New Mexico does have some Permian uh, vertebrate fossils, but uh, the museum here apparently doesn't have, have any. So we jump from right from that to the Triassic period. This is an old mural, but I'd say still probably very much uh, relevant. <clears throat> And then so we come in here to Dawn of the Dinosaurs, which they claim is the only Triassic Hall in North America. And you now after going through it, I'm kind of inclined to agree. I mean, they really go into the, the detail of the Triassic and also just showing all their stuff like this. It's a partial skeleton of a early reptile called an uh, Erythrosuchian. This is from the Moan Copy Formation, which has yielded mostly amphibians. So finding this reptile guy is its quite rare. And especially, I think, to find this much of it. As you can see, the thing is bloody big. Could probably bite you in half if it wanted to. Well, as you know, the Triassic is always called Dawn of the Dinosaurs, the Rise of the Dinosaurs. Even though first they didn't come along until the end of the period, and also they they were actually a minor component of the fauna. Uh, so here we have some stuff. Here's a lungfish burrow. You know, uh, lungfish, as you can see in the illustration here, are uh, known to dig a burrow and kind of encase themselves in the 
you know, it's the slimy cocoon of water to hibernate um, until more favorable conditions come, you know, mainly, mainly when it gets wetter and there's water that they can actually live in. Here's a couple little uh, tooth plates from lungfish. We come over here. The waters of Triassic New Mexico were actually home to a coelacanth, or rather something of the coelacanth family, you know, imaginatively called Chinlia. Sizable fish, at least you can eat smaller stuff. And here's its skull, which is pretty cool. And then here we have what may be a Triassic uh, palm tree. Uh, palm trees didn't come till later because uh, I know th there are plenty of palm fossils from the Cretaceous but I don't know of any palms uh, from before that but if this thing does turn out to be a palm then it would be uh, the oldest flowering plant or angiosperm we had conifers and potentially palms and ferns and stuff in the Triassic forests, but we also had these giant horse tails, kind of a holdover from the Paleozoic era. Probably just couldn't compete with uh, trees and whatnot. That's kind of what it looked like. Kind of some stems, and then here's the trunk. So now here's a skull and some neck vertebra. Uh, Coelophysis, the best known Triassic dinosaur. Um, and then over here, because this was also the time mammals first appeared, there's a partial skull. This is kind of the, uh, the back of the skull, like the brain case from a uh, little mammal called uh, Adelobacillus, which means obscure king. The king part probably because it's an early stem mammal. And it's probably what it looked like. Which is about what most mammals would look like during the age of dinosaurs. Uh, and check this out. You know, every museum has blocks from uh, the Ghost Ranch quarry in, uh, here in New Mexico at Coelophysis. But to me, this one is the most coherent. Because, I mean, look at that. You can actually right there make out skull, neck, and spine. Uh, let's see what else. Over here there's supposed to be the two kind of overlapping each other and stuff. Here's, let's see, you can make out another animal right there. I think there's supposed to be at least seven individuals in this block. Now that is awesome. Alright, now we have Placerius. You should remember him from Petrified Forest. And here he was being attacked by Rodondosaurus, uh, one of the biggest phytosaurs from the Chinle group. And that's like, I mean, you, you, you don't get how big this thing is from uh, looking at pictures. I mean, I saw a picture of it being, uh, the armature being welded together, and it's like, holy shit, that thing is huge. Um, yeah, I have little doubt that this thing would be able to just run up, grab that thing by the head, and then drag it into the water, like modern crocs do. And we may have some evidence of that. Because here's a uh, Decinodont femur, probably Placerius. You can see right there, little uh, those two puncture holes right there. And here's an amphibian chest bone, and it's got bite marks in it. Now we don't know for sure who did it, but considering that these things were the most common predators uh, at the end of the uh, Triassic, it probably was one of them. Just damn huge. Ah, now here's a pretty uh, cool and inventive way to display something. This is uh, an Aedosaur. Again, remember from Petrified Forest, they're the kind of the cross between an armadillo and a crocodile. And this is a gorgeous specimen. I mean, you can see all the plates and articulation. 
but what they did was rather than just you know display it laying down like this they made a bronze cast of it so that you can just look at it from every which way see more of the, the articulated plates and stuff but they say that uh, they think what happened was uh, some carnivore came along uh, flipped the carcass over and kind of scavenged the uh, some somewhat from the belly area and then remember when I said phytosaurs were the most common because I mean here look at just all these phytosaur skulls here's you know, Agus... Angus Dorinus. Mm hmm And as you can see, do a nice job here kind of showing the, uh, the subtle skull characteristics that help us tell them apart. Here's a Pseudopilatus, which I don't know if it's valid or not. Um, it's like dinosaur taxonomy, uh, phytosaur taxonomy is a mess. Another pseudopilatus, more pseudopilatus, even more pseudopilatus. So these must be rather common here, at least in this part of uh, the Chinle group. And here's one, uh, a display about suspected uh, sexual dimorphism. That's the difference between males and females. Here you can see this one has, you know, a uh, nice smooth snout there. And then you get up to this one who has this large crest. And they think that might be the male, because males tend to be a lot flashier than females in animals. There's a third one, which looks like maybe a bit of a crest, maybe. Oh, and then here, here's an actual fossil skull of Rodontosaurus, and again, nightmarishly big. I mean, not even the biggest crocodiles today have a skull this big. And that's why they think, you know, these phytosaurs, these huge phytosaurs, may have been up to 30 feet long. Nothing could have contended with them. Here are some of the uh, other Triassic reptiles. Remember that guy Van Clevia? Looked like he was diving for a fish. I guess he's a reptile then. And up here they apparently had a specimen or some stuff from a uh, one of the earliest turtles known, which they had right here from New Mexico, but apparently most of that's been removed, um, probably for study. But at least we got that little vertebra of it. And then here we have Trilophosaurus, which was like an iguana, but obviously not, because you've got this one species here who's kind of small. And then you have this job of them, obviously a much larger animal. And then, of course, the amphibians. Here we have Wetanaria. Here we have a little juvenile, which is pretty cool. And then, you know, this guy from... This guy's from Arizona is, uh... Yeah, Hadrocosaurus. Which is... He's pretty big as well. And then down here, Mastodonosaurus from Europe. I wonder anything that size has been found in the Chinle. Yeah, most Triassic, uh, early Jurassic tracks you see is this. It's called Gralator. Thought to be a little bipedal uh, theropod dinosaur. But check this out. They have a footprint that they think may have been made by an Aetosaur. And now we have entered the Jurassic the age of the supergiants. And what better way to start off talking about supergiants than wee bitty fish from uh, ancient uh, Lake Todilto that covered uh, New Mexico during the Middle Jurassic. And look at this one. Oh, come on, focus, you POS. And then, okay, you can't really focus in, but it's got sharp little teeth that there's a Viti world column from another fish. So fish on fish action. Alright, let's procrastinate on the giants more. 
Here's the ever familiar, the ever popular Stegosaurus. Got the plates, got the spiked tail, also called a Thagomizer. If you don't know what that is, just type it into Google and you should get the Far Side cartoon that inspired it. A pretty hefty dinosaur. But now for the main attraction, the actual super giants. Seismosaurus and Saurophaganax. And I mean, it is, I mean, I talk about stuff being big, but I mean, this thing is unimaginable. You literally have to see it. Because I mean, look at how they had to curve the tail and bend the neck just to get it to fit in the room. Just unbelievable. I mean, I mean, I've seen lots of giant dinosaur skeletons, sauropods and whatnot, Alan, you know, there was the Alamosaurus at the Perot Museum, but this is the first one that's actually making me genuinely feel small. Now, here are some of the only known remains of Saurophaganax, which right now is known from here and Oklahoma. Um, some doubt its existence. They think it's just a large Allosaurus. But I don't know if anyone's really done an in-depth study to try and test that idea. Because here it is reconstructed. You know, of course, they kind of made a large Allosaurus to reconstruct it, but... You know, I once heard a suggestion in a comment section, you know, because uh, a few uh, Carcharodonosaurid teeth are known from the Jurassic of Tanzania, Africa. So, what if we tried to reevaluate re this animal, not as an allosaurid, but as a caradonosaurid? You know, who knows? We might have more of this animal, but it was just called Allosaurus, big individual. Here's the very famous leg of Brachiosaurus, originally called Ultrasaurus, that of course was sunk into Brachiosaurus. Still impressive though. And then all along here we have the actual fossils of Seismosaurus. Um, speaking of uh, sunk, uh, a few years ago, Seismosaurus got sunk into Diplodocus. It was, you know, instead of Seismosaurus Halorum, it was renamed Diplodocus Halorum. I know science has its rules and its customs to, you know, ensure its success, you know, make sure it's doing the right thing and whatnot. But I think this is one instance where science is just wrong. Seismosaurus is so much of a cooler name than Diplodocus or Diplodocus. I mean, would you really name one of the biggest animals to ever walk the earth Diplodocus? Ugh. I think Diplodocus, I think Diplodocus halorum and the rules of scientific nomenclature it wrote in on need to eat a dick. And uh, go look up uh, Leviathan Melvilli for another example of why the rules of scientific naming can sometimes be stupid. But anyway, here's the, the huge pelvis with the sacrum. More of the sacrum, but um, I think it was originally uh, some of these tailbones that were found by a couple hikers in 1979. Um, so anyway, here's Saurophaganax again. You know, again, I've seen plenty of large theropods, especially Tyrannosaurus rex. And yet this guy is just really... Because they describe it as being the size of T-Rex. So, I mean, again, this thing is just really making me feel, you know, small. Because I know, I mean, you look at dinosaurs. I mean, the Allosaurus specimens I've seen in museums are like six feet at the hips. They're not these huge, giant predators always made out to be. But, I mean, this thing, though... This thing's kind of living up to the hype. <laughs> and see again, I mean, I, I just can't show you 
Seismosaurus very well because it is just so big and long. It was long, but it wouldn't have been as heavy as, you know, some of these titanosaurs are uh, they bringing out of South America because it was a diplodocid, and their one of their features is they're kind of is they're relatively light for their size, you know, like the these vertebra and stuff are full of air sacs to try and lighten the load. Oh, yeah, before, before we leave the Jurassic, here's some uh, Jurassic eggshells. I think those are almost unheard of in the Morrison. So again, very important. You know, I imagine if this was living in the time of early humans, I have no doubt they'd be using those ribs for uh, tent poles to build their huts and houses. The long bones would probably be used to make tools and weapons, I imagine. I imagine if these giant dinosaurs were around in times of early man, bone would have been a very... Bone probably would have been the, the basis of their material culture rather than stone. All right. Let's go to the Cretaceous. And, oh yeah. Birds to dinosaurs. Yep, birds are dinosaurs. You see, that's not a pigeon, that's a dinosaur. Blah, blah, blah. All right, we're now in the, the Cretaceous period when New Mexico was at, you know, any given time was uh, on the edge of the Inland Sea to varying degrees. I believe this is supposed to be about like 75 million years ago when, yeah, all the western states were kind of on that, on that sea coast. Now, here's a, a juvenile tyrannosaur who uh, was originally called Dasplitosaurus because it seemed, again, just kind of refer something to an already known animal. That was, of course, before dinosaur provincialism. But, you know, when they uh, discovered uh, Vistahi Verser, you know, New Mexico's unique Tyrannosaur. Uh, this thing was reclassified as a juvenile of that species. And, you know, whether it's, whatever its classification, it's got the classic uh, juvenile Tyrannosaur features, like these uh, relatively long legs and feet, and a uh, lighter build, probably much faster than the adults probably relied more just on their size and strength to take their prey. Here's a big old palm stump from the Fruitland slash Kirtland formation. I guess they weren't sure. I think the stratigraphy of that place is still being worked out. But you can tell it's a palm because palm trees have these very distinct, you know, root clusters. As you can see, they just got all these little roots, one on top of another, on top of another created kind of something like a seaweed's hold fast. Here's a cast of a Penaceratops skull. I think this was the one discovered by the American Museum. Um, here are dromaeosaur uh, claws. They believed to be maybe the, the second killing claw. And uh, Spherotholus is currently off display. That makes me a sad panda. But of course, you know, not always about the dinosaurs. Like, here's some uh, little fossils from lizards, Cretaceous lizards, uh, clams that would have lived in the uh, waters of the seacoast. Ancient New Mexico, and here's a crocodile, or they say alligator. Judging from that scoot, though, that would have been pretty big, probably like the size of the largest American alligators, at least. And then here's a cast, because for some reason the real one is in Pennsylvania. This is uh, Notocephalosaurus, who for a while was New Mexico's only resident ankylosaur until uh, Zia Pelta was announced earlier this year, I think. This year or last year, I can't remember. I, I don't, in case you can't tell, I don't follow dinosaurs as closely as I do mammals. Here's a turtle shell. 
plenty of turtles in the Cretaceous. And here are, uh, here are gar uh, scales. You know, gars are these primitive fish that have been around for like a hundred million years and hardly changed. Here's a tibia or shin bone of a hadrosaur, which, you know, have been called the cows of the Cretaceous just because they're so abundant. Except this cow, the meat from this cow would probably yield 5,000 hamburgers or something. <laughs> So, you know, kind of, again, going with the seacoast theme. Got a little tank of fish, marine fossils, and of course, you know, seabirds who you constantly hear calling and squawking. All right, this is a, a fruit locules of something called Paleoaster. Uh, it's a Cretaceous fruit. The display says it may have been a member of the poppy family. So maybe it looks like New Mexico's drug problem extended all the way back into the Mesozoic. You know, the dinosaurs were shooting up heroin before you had uh, gangbanger homies cooking meth. Or Brian Cranston. <laughs> Here's more of the seacoast. You know, I've seen pictures on Flickr where you have a much clearer view of the dinosaur here. But it's now obscured because I'm pretty sure they're using live plants. But that's okay. I mean, it almost feels like the wild. You know, you're spying an animal in the brush. All right, now here's a partial skull with a whole crest of Parasaurolophus tubicins. Now, this skull was uh, uh, probed with a CT scanner, and that led to, this, to the discovery that the crest contained a complex network of air chambers. And so, uh, reconstructing those air chambers, uh, scientists uh, blew air through them, and so these may have been the sounds used by Parasaurolophus. Listen. Now, are they going to do that with any other of the Lambiosaurines? I mean, were their crests purely for show, or did they have airways as well? Here's another cast of a Pentaceratops skull, but this one apparently is here at the museum. Goody, I say. Um, it's got some deformation, which almost kind of gives them more like cat cattle horns. Um, Nasutoceratops from Utah, of course, has actual cattle horns. But, yeah. That is awesome. There actually was at SVP a poster. They apparently found a mostly complete skeleton of a juvenile of Pentaceratops. Uh, the museum here doing that. Alright, now the sound came from this direction, so I'm guessing this is supposed to be Parasaurolophus, except it hardly has a crest to speak of. And keep in mind, this was made before the uh, ALF Museum discovered that uh, one-year-old baby Parasaurolophus, and it had a crest, crest structure like that. So it's more confusing than so that appears to be a juvenile, and yet it's looking over some more infants and newly hatched. So who knows, maybe uh, teen pregnancy problems also extended all the way back to the Mesozoic. Just going through the sea coast. Yeah, here we go, you can see her. Presumably her much better. That stuff. Very nice exhibit, but, you know, as we get to the end of the Cretaceous, that means it's extinction time.
get obliterated. hydrosaur skeletons being used for the, the death of the dinosaurs. <laughs> we rule now. And from the sound of things, that nasty meteor is about to hit the earth, so we, we better cut it here. Oh, here we are. Remember when I talked about garfish? These are gar. Specifically, these are Spotted gar. There's a little modest sized fish. You know, of course, alligator gar. 
can grow up to like over six feet long, weigh a couple hundred pounds. It's kind of, you know, their teeth and stuff, all that would make them seem like nasty predators, but as you can see there, most of the time just kind of lazy fish. Now, here's where if you're going fishing, you want to ditch the pull, uh, pull and hook for a harpoon. Now, this is a mosasaur. I mean, we saw this at uh, the Texas Memorial Museum yesterday in, in skeleton form. It's shown here with the, uh, you know, swimming bird Hesperornis. I don't know if any of that is known from New Mexico. Oh. I should probably read the sign first. Stupid me, as usual. Um, they found a hind limb from this bird, or a closely related one, in uh, New Mexico near Farmington. Here's the Hickorya mosasaur. Not a whole lot there, but it shows. You know, mosasaurs were here in New Mexico. Here's a cool display about marine fossils. You see just all the brachiopods and snails and shark teeth, ammonites, who came in various sizes with a few uh, lone plesiosaur bones. Remember when I talked about Karen Carr? You know, I love her mirrors. Well, this one's by Carr. And you can kind of see what I mean. It's kind of got the that artistic quality to it. Here's the, the prehistoric seabed. All kinds of dead shells. Now that is a hell of a clam. They have one of these at the LA Museum. You could probably make a hundred bowls of chowder with that guy. Now why do I keep talking about food? Maybe I'm getting hungry. Here he is, uh, Zia Pelta, in this very ominous looking cave. It's yeah, a much nicer skull than uh, Notocephalosaurus. And I kind of like Ankylosaurus more because uh, they're kind of closer to my scale and they're because you know, I kind of like the Ceratopsis and the Ankylosaurus more because, you know, the Hadrosaurs just have such a, just such a weird body plan, you know? Whereas these guys seem more conventional. All right, few oligocene fossils are known from New Mexico because it was the age of volcanoes. Intense volcanic activity. And here we go deeper and deeper into the earth. Oh crap, I forgot to pack my sunblock. And my spray bottle. Whew. The molten interior of the earth. Not for the faint of heart. And here we have a lava flow. Now I feel like I'm on the Back to the Future ride. Which wouldn't be a bad thing. I mean, I, I actually missed that ride, but anyway. Now that is how you teach people about volcanoes and the interior of the earth. Now volcanoes can be the stuff of nightmares, but they can also be the stuff of dreams. As you can see, here's all sorts of minerals, including my birthstone, that were formed uh, by you know, volcanic activity, or at least brought to the surface by volcanic activity. This is pretty cool. This is a stalagmite that was created by lava dripping from the ceiling. Here's a very interesting case of Pohoihoi lava. Again, caused by uh, uh, lava dripping from the ceiling. Good times. Brave the volcano. And now the cave. Uh, New Mexico's caves have yielded many important fossils. Because you see what happens is sometimes you get a, an opening 
in the roof of the cave that acts as a pitfall. Animals and plants fall in and die. And then the cool, dry conditions of the cave preserve them. As you can see, like here's some unwashed material. Here it is that's been screen washed. And then here's all the little bones and looks like uh, maybe pack rat poop sifted out. But you don't just get small animals, you know, like that wee bitty vole, but you get larger animals like camels. All right, I believe this is now a wet cave. You see you got all the, the rock structure. Cool, cool, cool. God, it's been forever since I've been to a cave. All right, so that was the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. And yeah, I'm wearing a different shirt because it's the day after, but this is finally when I got a chance to do it because yesterday I ran out of both battery and card. And so that was unbelievable. I mean, their exhibits, you know, the stuff they had on display were just fantastic. I mean, that was well worth it, going there. Uh, you know, I just wish I could have showed you more. You know, but uh, a criticism though. Sorry. Uh, one criticism though, and that is that their Cenozoic section, no need to mince words here, it sucked balls. I mean, there's a reason why you didn't see it. I mean, why I didn't just, you know, get another car memory card and another battery and show it to you. That's because there wasn't really that much to, to show you. I mean, you know, the Ice Age exhibit was a little bit better than the tertiary exhibit because, you know, at least they had the, you know, some recreated uh, rocks with some skeletons and of course that gorgeous mural showing Ice Age New Mexico but yeah basically the tertiary section had a cast skeleton of Gastornis that's diatrima for those of you who haven't caught up a skull a partial skull and a jaw of a brontothere and some tracks that's it Oh yeah, they did have a skeleton of some kind of critter who got caught in a volcanic lahar, so that... But still, that's four. Four things on display, and because of course... God damn this stupid... Ugh. You know, that of course brings it up to four, and, you know, the Gastorna skeleton, that's a cast, so, I mean... And they, they just, it's like they just, uh, you know, stuck up these huge murals. You know, they're the classic Smithsonian murals. And, you know, threw out a, a few random specimens. And, you know, that, that's not really an exhibit. I mean, that's, it's not even trying. So, I mean, you go through the Mesozoic and see all these beautiful exhibits, you know, all these wonderful specimens, you know, the animals reconstructed in life as they, you know, reconstructed as they were in life. You know, you go through the volcano, you go through the cave, all this wonderful stuff, and then you come to the Cenozoic, and it's just blah. I mean, and, I mean, it's not like for lack of material. I mean, New Mexico has an exceptional Cenozoic record. I mean, I... doing. Anyway, it's what I consider to be one of the five best states for the Cenozoic. Because not only do you have great, you know, uh, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and Miocene stuff, but, you know, New Mexico has such Be great Eocene left lane. material. Then turn left on West and it has, Road. you know, the rarest of Cenozoic uh, fossils, uh, Paleocene fossils. They have a lot of them. And good ones. I mean, like skulls and other bones have been found in it, not just teeth. You know, so, I mean, they already did Dawn of the Dinosaurs with the Triassic, so why not have Rise of the Mammals? Talk about the Paleocene and Neocene. You know, so it's like, 
that that really needs to be rectified, I feel like. Because, uh, I mean, if, you know, fragmentary stuff like uh, the Fruitland and Kirtland formations, you know, can be incorporated into exhibits, then why not all this Turn awesome left, stuff from the, the center zone? Right. So at the end of the day, I mean, I'd recommend it. Going there is so great, but at the, you know, when you go through these exhibits, it's so, so wonderful, and then it kind of... It hits you like a kick in the nuts. That this is the same institution where Spencer Lucas works. Um, I'm of course referring to something called Adagate. Um, A-E-T-O-G-A-T-E, Adagate. Google that and you will see just what a hot mess that was and, you know, kind of, uh, this guy who worked who works at that museum, and maybe even the museum itself. I haven't read everything about it yet. Um, it's really ugly stuff. It, you know, it makes you wonder. You know, wait, that's the same institution that brought us these, you know, wonderful exhibits. So you know, that was the uh, like I said, that was the Albuquerque Museum. I just loved it. I mean, that's absolutely going into my Uber album. <laughs> as I call it. And today was the Arizona uh, Museum of Natural History. I met uh, Gavin McCullough there. Um, I met him at SVP and I told him I was going to stop at the museum on the way home. And he, and he said, uh, let him know. And so he took me in back and he showed me uh, some of their stuff. You know, that was pretty cool. And then I kind of, you know, the dinosaur exhibit the dinosaur hall wasn't so great just because just casts, you know. And, you know, Cenozoic stuff was practically non-existent. You know, that's that's some stuff that needs to be worked on. And so, but you know, they still had some cool stuff, and that's what you saw. Um, or what you will see in the next video. Like I'm getting my uh, tent I'm getting my uh, tenses mixed up. So, yeah, it's now a uh, four-hour drive to Indio, California, but I'll finally be back in California. So, I'll see you in the final chapter Turn left on Arizona uh, 202. tomorrow.